Well, good morning, Four Corners Church. What a blessing it is to be gathered in a room with people singing Christ in power resurrected as I will be when he comes or Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. You know, we take for granted these things. We are gathered here singing the praises of God, that God is enthroned on the praises of his people. And we see him this morning enthroned in the praise and on the praise of the people of God here at Four Corners. What a joy to gather and to be a part of this. If you would go with me in your Bibles at this point to Romans chapter 7, verses 1 to 4. Today we begin a new chapter in Paul's most famous letter. And I just want to say, I'm, I've told many of you this in kind of private one-on-one conversations, but I am so thankful to God for the opportunity to preach through Romans. You really uh, just have to know what a joy it is as a pastor, as a preacher, to have the opportunity to do this, to go through a book like Romans. I felt the same way, well, about every text, but Romans in particular, in special ways, Genesis as well, just what a blessing to go through such a book. And I was telling someone last week that it has been such a blessing to study through Romans slowly. I've spent a lot of time in Romans uh, throughout my adult life and even as a child, uh, just by osmosis, especially during teenage years, it was only by osmosis during that period for me, unfortunately. Uh, But just uh, having been in Romans many times in my life and having absorbed it, it is such a special thing to be able to go through it and study it in such detail, to be able to see how Paul's argument unfolds in detail and, and to be able to see how the various parts of the letter fit together. You know, the big sections and the subsections and, and the transitions and, and so forth. And I hope that when you come to the Bible that you care about such things. There is a culture of Bible reading that gives little time to those kinds of things and uh, just sort of comes to the Bible in what has been called a devotional way, but it's not devotional at all, really, at the end of the day, uh, because we, know, we don't understand the text when we don't pay attention to those sorts of things. So it has been great to go through and to see these. And as we come to Romans chapter 7, Paul's attention turns to the law. And we've, we've seen that already a little bit, but that becomes the focus here as we come into chapter 7, the law of God, the Mosaic law, the law given through Moses, the law that is written in the first five books of the Bible. All of those five books are considered the law. Of course, we don't have those laws uh, written out uh, earlier on. In Genesis, for example, it's more narrative, sort of building towards the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. But uh, those five books are known and were known in Jesus' day as the Torah, the law. What is the relationship of the Christian to God's law? This is a big question. A very big question. This question of law and gospel has been a difficult one throughout the history of Christianity. For 2,000 years now, theologians, pastors, commentators, evangelists, writers, fill in the blank, have reflected on this particular question. What is the relationship of the Christian to God's law? It is a big question. It is a multifaceted question, and as I said, interpreters have struggled significantly to understand how it is to be put together in the Bible, but even more specifically to understand how Paul puts these things together. How does the Apostle Paul himself relate the Christian to the law? And in coming at this question, one of the most important sections of Scripture is Romans 7. 
So we are kind of at a base point, and there are others for sure, 2 Corinthians 3, as was read earlier, and Galatians as an entire book. There are many places we would go in trying to construct a theology on this question and trying to understand the answer to this larger question. But Romans 7 is a basic text. It is one of the most significant. And one of the great things about going through Romans is we get so many of those in the book of Romans. So we said this at the beginning that when we were going through Romans 1, that what we find there at the end of Romans 1 is one of the most significant texts on human sin. That if we're to understand what does the Bible teach about sin, the end of Romans 1 is key. Justification by faith. Romans 3 and 4, so significant to understanding that doctrine. The doctrine of sanctification, Romans 6. So there are so many places in Romans that are ground zero for the various doctrines of the Christian faith. And now we come to Romans 7, where this question of law and gospel becomes very significant. So as we come to this question... And as we enter into this chapter, there are three major interpretive keys that we need to scoop up from the context. Before we even go into Romans 7, three major interpretive keys to scoop up. These are things that we've already studied in Romans. And let me just say to you, uh, just to stay with me, this is going to be a significantly longer, I don't know that I'd use the word significantly, but this is going to be a longer introduction than you are used to in a sermon. So uh, just stay with me. But I think these preliminary things need to be said before we even get into Romans 7. And so these are interpretive keys that we need to scoop up from the context to help us understand Christian and law. So first, first key. As Paul has described it so far, the relationship between the Christian and the law cannot be understood apart from sin and death. Specifically, the linking together of sin and death with the law. Where the law dominates, sin and death dominate. Where the dominion of the law is removed, sin and death are removed and vice versa. So as we've been going through Romans 6, the one thing we cannot miss is that it's a package deal for Paul. Sin, death, law. One package as he explains it. That is why Paul can say that we were slaves of sin, that's the past, but are now slaves of righteousness. He says that in chapter 6, verses 17 to 18. And then he also says in verse 14 that we are not under law, but under grace. Do you see how he's doing that? So to be a slave of sin and to be under law are together. To be a slave of righteousness and to be under grace are understood Together. So it's important that we see this package deal. In other words, to be under law is to be a slave of sin. To be under grace is to be a slave of righteousness. They go together. So that's the first interpretive key. As we get into this question about the Christian and the law, get that one down first. Second, since chapter 5, Paul has given us two domains or spheres So we've got this package with two masters, but we also have this language of two spheres or dominions, going back to chapter five. We have the sphere or the dominion of in Adam, the domain of in Adam. And then we have the sphere or the domain of being in Christ. So Paul's building that out as he goes through from chapter five. Being under the law is associated with being in Adam, that sphere, where sin and death reign. And being under grace is associated with freedom from the law, sin and death in Christ. So do you see that? Two spheres, two domains. And so we read this in chapter 5, verse 17. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, 
Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So do you see that? Life, righteousness in Christ, death, sin in Adam. Two domains, two spheres. And then here's the third interpretive key. Paul also has in mind two covenants. Now, the question of the covenants in the Bible is a very challenging one. And and once again, there have been many different uh, ways of coming at the different covenants mentioned in the Bible. But for this particular point, I just want you to see that redemptive history can be divided into two major covenants or two testaments. So we're not just talking about two spheres, but we're also talking about two periods in the history of God's dealings with his people. The people of God under the old covenant and the people of God under the new covenant. So two masters, two spheres, two covenants. Two major periods in redemptive history. We see this in chapter 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. Something has happened in Christ. A a new period of history has begun in Christ, but now something has happened. And what was before that point pointed forward to that point. That's what Paul says in Romans 3.21. But listen to this. Galatians 4, verses 4 to 5. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law. That's amazing. Christ was under the law. Christ is the king. Christ is the law giver. The law itself is an expression of the character of the triune God. He is the second person of the Trinity. And we are told he was born under the law. So that period of redemptive history in which the law was over the people of God. And it says that he was born to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. So why in the world do I introduce the sermon with all of this information, this little mini sermon? Well, it's important for going into chapter 7 because today Paul, at the beginning of Romans 7, tells us something striking. We've got to have those nuts and bolts in place as we come to this striking statement of the apostle in chapter 7. He tells us something that should knock us off of our feet. We take it for granted because, especially if we've grown up in church, we've heard this sort of thing before. But what Paul says to us at the beginning of Romans 7 should knock us flat. And it would have knocked his Jewish readers flat for sure. He says that we have died to the law, God's law. He says we've died to the law, that we are released from the law, God's law, given, written, the Mosaic law. Now, the reason why this should strike us so strangely is because so far we've been told that we are dead to sin. That makes sense. It makes sense when you're talking about salvation and redemption and renewal and restoration and so forth uh, to be told that you're dead to something intrinsically bad. Sin is intrinsically bad. It makes perfect sense to say we're dead to that. And it makes sense, in a sense, to say we're also dead to death. We died to sin and death. Those things no longer are over us. It makes sense because those things are bad. What's hard to understand is to be told that we are dead to what is good. The law of God is intrinsically good, perfect, and righteous. Paul will go on to say in, later in Romans 7. So the law is beautiful. It is majestic. 
It is righteous and holy and perfect. It is the expression of God's character and will. So to be told that we are dead to that should knock us on our back. But that's exactly what Paul does. And this especially should be the case after reading through the Old Testament and reading things like Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who delights in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. So we've already been told, Bible reader, that we are to fixate on the law of God and treasure the law of God. Read Psalm 119. The love of God's law, his statutes, his decrees, his commandments is everywhere in that psalm and throughout the psalms and throughout the prophets and the proverbs and so forth. So I give you all this information to help us see that we need these these keys in place. We need these clues in place before we even come at this question so that we don't take a misstep. Because unless we understand this context, we will misinterpret what Paul means. We will overinterpret the text to be saying that we can now live however we please in Christ. Dead to law like we're dead to sin. Dead to law, law gone, law irrelevant, law insignificant. That God's law is no longer important to the Christian and that would be a mistake. That would be a great error if we overinterpret this or we fail to understand it in its context. So we don't want to make that error. We don't want to fall into that pit. And how do we know that would be a mistake? I mean, maybe you're thinking, well, that's not a mistake. I mean, isn't that exactly what Paul says? And and, and some, if not many, throughout Christian history have come to a conclusion like that. And even among the Reformers, there's wrestling over the relationship between the Christian and the law, between Luther's view and Calvin's view, and we see this just unfolding throughout Christian history, throughout Protestant history. But how do we know that it would be a mistake to interpret it in that way that I just mentioned? Two texts from Romans. Seal the deal, really. Romans 3.31 is the first one. Listen to what Paul says. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means, Paul says. Of course not. God forbid the same emphatic negative that he's given on other things that are unthinkable. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Now what Paul is saying is that in the life of a Christian and in this gospel proclamation, the law of God is upheld. It's upheld. So how in the world can we say that the law has no more significance or importance for the Christian when in fact Paul is saying that gospel proclamation and the embracing of the gospel has the end of upholding God's holy law? We can't. And then the second text is Romans 8, 4. That Christ came and died for us. Listen to this. In order that... The righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The end for which Christ died was that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled. And how is that taking shape? Through life in the Spirit. We'll talk more about that in weeks to come. So that's it for introductory stuff. If you want to go ahead and stand at this point, we're going to read God's word together. Our death to the law. That is the title for the sermon this morning. Our death to the law. And we come at this question cautiously. We want to follow what Paul is saying. Our death to the law. We're going to read chapter 7, verses 1 to 4. This is God's word. It is perfect and holy and profitable for us. 
Or do you not know, brothers? For I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive, but if her husband dies, she is free from that law, and if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. You can go ahead and be seated. We're going to do verses 5 and 6 next time. And they, they uh, unpack verse 4, really, so it can be treated in their own right. But let me uh, go to the Lord in prayer and just ask for his blessing on our time. Ask that his word would be clear to us, that we would leave here understanding it, and, uh, and that it would be applied to our lives, to our hearts, by the Spirit, and that we would leave here changed. We'd be different because we've come here today and sat under God's holy word. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what you have revealed to us here in these first four verses of Romans chapter 7. Lord, uh, we believe that the Bible is verbally inspired, that the very words are your words. They are God-breathed, every jot and tittle, originally written by the apostles, prophets, Moses, and others. This is your holy word. It is, as Jesus says, unbreakable. We worship you, God, for giving us such a precious treasure in your written word. And over the thousands, even years, of transmission, how you have preserved your word for us, and how even scholars who would come to your word and, and, and seek to dismantle it or seek to uh, explain it as unreliable, how uh, the kinds of arguments that they must resort to are so trivial and petty and uh, simplified, simplistic. Lord, thank you that your word stands and it has withstood much scrutiny much investigation, and today we come under it and it still stands, and it will always stand. Heaven and earth will pass away, but your word remains forever. We praise you for this, God, and we come now to hear it. We come now to understand it. We pray that you would help me to be able to explain it clearly, that we would see what's here in this text, and and Lord, that we would love you and worship you more as a result of encountering these words. And God, we pray that your spirit who lives in us as Christians, that he would guide us in accordance with what we find here today. Lord, we pray for our kids as they are learning your word in their classrooms and those who are here uh, with us, gathered with the corporate body. We pray that you would speak into their hearts, Lord, that uh, those sermons are oftentimes over their heads, Lord, we pray that, that you would take the words and make them clear to them in their own way and that, God, it would penetrate their hearts. They would see the grandeur of your glory. They would see the power of your gospel and that they would love and treasure the life that you have called us to in Christ. God, I pray that for all of us now as we come to your word. We thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. As Paul presents the fact that we, as Christians, are dead to the law, released from the dominion of the law, he does this in three steps in these verses, verses one to four. Three steps, so these are the points this morning. Number one, the principle. Number two, the picture. And number three, the point. These are the three moves Paul makes 
as he begins to answer this question. And let me say this, uh, as we go through, not all of your questions are going to be answered today on this question. And even in fact, when we get down to Romans 7, it, 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 we're, we're not, the intention is not to give, you know, use this as an opportunity to write a book on law and gospel. But what we will see in this main text and in these verses introducing this main text is we'll see much to work with in coming at this larger Question. So the principle, the picture, and the point. First, let's look at the principle. Look with me at verse one, just this first verse. Or do you not know, brothers? For I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. Now, in place of binding on, you could put their rules over. Just depends on how you render that, but the law is binding on or rules over a person only as long as he lives. Some of Paul's readers were Jewish, but it is likely that the great majority, regardless of whether they were Jew or Gentile, were steeped in, God, in the Old Testament scriptures. And we know this because Paul is very frequently quoting from the Old Testament. He does this throughout his letters. And we have to remember that very early on, uh, Paul would go to the Jewish synagogues and he would preach and there would be, Jew, there would be uh, Jewish believers. But also the, that many of the Gentile believers came from uh, Jewish proselytes. They came from God-fearers and so forth. And we know that the beginning of the Roman church was likely predominantly Jewish, uh, coming from Pentecost in Acts 2, that there were people there hearing Peter preach from Rome, and they would have gone back to Rome, and those, that probably is the origin of the church in Rome. But regardless of the makeup of Paul's readership, the, ex the extent that they were, they were Jews and, uh, or Gentiles, it is likely that they, by and large, knew the law. They knew the Hebrew Bible, or at least the Septuagint, they knew the Old Testament. As those who know the law, Paul's audience understands very well what it means to be under law. They would have understood what Paul means, and that's why he begins in the way that he does. Or do you not know, brothers, I'm speaking to those who know the law, and then he goes on to make his statement. And here, Paul is setting forth one basic principle. So that's the reason for the first point, the principle. He is setting forth in this verse one basic principle. And here it is. Where there is law, it is in effect only when a person is alive. Just a basic principle. If a person is alive, law applies. When they die, it no longer applies. It's common sense. To die is to be released from it. It is to be moved out from underneath it. This is a common sense principle. Death ends the obligation. It ends the obligation because you're no longer alive to it. You're gone as it were. You're gone. Listen to the way John Stott describes this. He says, this authority is limited to our lifetime. Speaking of, of law, the one thing which invalidates it is death. Death brings release from all contractual obligations involving the dead person. We know this because when a person dies, other people in the family have to sort of sort things out because that person is no longer there, no longer there to pay bills. They no longer uh, have those contractual agreements. Those who are left behind have to sort of sort the estate. He goes on. So law is for life. Death annuls it. Paul states this as a legal axiom universally accepted and unchallenged. So it's just a basic principle. He starts these verses with this principle. But now Paul wants to illustrate it with a picture. And that brings us to our second point, the picture. Look at verses two to three. This is a picture of the principle. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. 
Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Here, Paul wants to give a picture of the general principle he's just laid out. It is as though Paul is saying, consider how this plays out in the realm of marriage. He's simply showing visually what he's talking about so that he can move on to the subsequent verses. A woman has a husband, and she is bound to him while he lives. To marry another while he lives is to commit adultery. And here's the big idea that Paul wants to capitalize on. None of this applies once he's dead, right? All of that applies while he lives. That's what Paul's saying. But once he dies, none of that applies any longer. She is free. She is not bound, not enslaved to the law of marriage. She is free to marry whomever she wishes at that point. The union has ended through death. So let me state it briefly. Death severs the union and removes the obligation. Death severs the union and removes the obligation. That is the principle Paul lays out in verse 1, and that is the principle he illustrates or pictures in verses 2 to 3. So now let me deal with something that, you know, you have to deal with. It's kind of the elephant in the room. Some have mistakenly taken this text to definitively teach that remarriage after divorce is always adultery. So we got to deal with that. That's not Paul's point. Paul's using this in order to make another point, which we're going to get to in a moment. That's why point number three is the point. But I do want us to see that this is a question we can't just skate over. We have to Deal with it. It, It's right here. So as I said before, I'll say it again. Some have mistakenly taken this text to definitively teach that remarriage after divorce is always adultery. That only remarriage after the death of a spouse is permissible. So some hold that view in the church today. Well-known pastors, preachers, writers have held that view, some of whom would take a text like Romans 7, verses 2 and 3, and use that as evidence for that comprehensive barring of remarriage and divorce. I think this would be reading, I'll, say, I'll state it briefly, I'll say it a little bit more, but I think this would be reading too much into these verses. I don't want to spend too much time on this, But I do want to give you a couple of quotes and a couple of texts to help situate what what he's saying here. So here are a couple of quotes that I think state it well and give give a little bit of a different nuance to it. So the first one comes from Thomas Schreiner, a well-known New Testament scholar and a Pauline scholar in particular. And he's written an excellent commentary on Romans, which you've heard me quote many times. But Thomas Schreiner says this. Not surprisingly, some have tried to appeal to this text in order to support their view of divorce and remarriage. This text cannot settle that question since it isn't Paul's intention to provide a full discussion of his view of divorce and remarriage. The general principle is that divorce and remarriage constitute adultery. But we cannot conclude from this text alone that divorce and remarriage are always adultery. Paul employs a generalization for the sake of the illustration at hand. So you gotta, you got to ask the question, what's Paul doing? What's Paul doing with this? And not go off into left field with the text. You have to take it in its context. That's all Thomas Schreiner is saying. Not really making a point. He's just saying, don't misuse the text. A bit more forcefully... Uh, John MacArthur comments this way, this passage has absolutely nothing to say about divorce. 
and cannot legitimately be used as an argument from silence to teach that divorce is never justified for a Christian and consequently that only the death of a spouse gives the right to remarry. Such a discussion requires treatment of other passages. And so both are saying, look, let's treat the text responsibly. Thomas Schreiner simply saying, look, uh, this can't be used in that way. And MacArthur is coming in saying the same thing, but he's actually saying uh, definitively in, in his view that it doesn't deal with divorce. Well, let me just give you a few passages I would argue that these passages show that divorce and remarriage are in some unique cases not to be considered adultery. So some would disagree with this point, and there are books out there on this, and actually you can go back to uh, the time we spent in Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, and you can look at how we discussed that. But at least I will say that there are at least a few texts that suggests, and I think even show, that it is not always adultery when there is divorce and then remarriage. So Matthew 5.32 is the first. That's why I referred to the Sermon on the Mount. We, we treated this text in detail then. Now I'm just going to cite it, make a comment. But it says this, But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So there we have the woman in view. And then, of course, the man is in view at the end there. But we have the same thing in Matthew 19, 9. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, once again, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. So it seems that Jesus has provided an exception clause here with regard to divorce and remarriage, that in the case of sexual immorality, there is an exception. We get a little bit of for why this is the case in 1 Corinthians 6, you know, the joining yourself to another, becoming one flesh with another in fornication and so forth. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is another text, verses 13 to 15. This is the last one I'll give you. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever, and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. So in the early church, there were many mixed marriages because pagans were becoming believers. Uh, people who worshiped Apollo bowed the knee to the Christ and stopped worshiping Apollo and all the other gods. They became Christians, and in some cases, women. In fact, there were early uh, uh, antagonist to Christianity who would say that Christianity was just a, a, a ridiculous religion among women and children. Because they were arguing, which wasn't the case, but they were arguing that it was really just a, a, a religion of, as they saw it in, in the way that they were referring to women and children, uh, among the ignorant. Not among the, those who were knowledgeable. Not among those who were leading in society. It was something that was passed along in kitchens and at shops not something that was really considered substantively and that really had any credence. This is the way early pagan writers attacked Christianity. And so that tells us there were probably many women who were married uh, to pagan husbands, Christian women. And so Paul deals with it. If anyone has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. She should stay with him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But listen to this. If the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. So Christian wife, married to a pagan husband, he doesn't want to be married anymore. Let it be so. And that implies that divorce is in view because he's just talked about divorce. She should not divorce him. And now he goes down and says, but if he leaves her, so the implication is if there's a divorce. In such cases, here it is, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. 
Focus on that. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. And I think that implies that for such a believer who is married to a pagan, who divorces him or her and walks away from the marriage, that person is not enslaved so that they are able to divorce and remarry. So I'll stop there. This is a big, big topic, and that's not what the text is about. But these are some, I think, helpful observations as we go through this text for coming at this question. Let me say this, though. It is a reminder of the seriousness of marriage. Okay? It is a reminder. I've just been explaining why remarriage is not necessarily adultery. But we need to understand that apart from those exceptions... Marriage is to be unbreakable. Now, we recognize God is merciful, God is gracious, and he restores. He does many gracious things in the midst of our sin. But what we need to understand about marriage is that it is an an unbreakable bond with very few exceptions. What God has joined together, Jesus says, let not man break apart, tear asunder. The old King James Version of it. Let not man break apart. But we haven't even come to Paul's main point yet. For that, we have to look at verse 4. So let's go to verse 4 as we finish up this morning. Now we come to the point. We've seen the principle. We've seen the principle uh, illustrated, the picture of it. We've dealt with an issue there. Uh, regarding divorce and remarriage that we need to as we pass over those verses. And now we come to Paul's point here in verse four. Here's what he says. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may, may bear fruit for God. Here's the big idea. Here's the main proposition. Here's the radical idea that Paul has been setting up all along. As Christians, we have died to the law. And like I said before, this is is an idea that would have been earth-shaking to a Jewish reader coming at this text, reading this for the first time. Maybe there's someone visiting the believers there sort of intermingling with them, and they hear this read, this would have been earth-shaking to them. As Christians, we have died to the law. As Jewish Christians, Paul would say, as we read in our call to worship, he had died to the law. This is the former Pharisee. This is the former teacher of the law. This is a scribe, a man who had sort of lived under the shadow of a scribe like Ezra, who was always meditating on the law, treasuring the law. The kings were to meditate on the law continually. Joshua was told when he went into the promised land that he was to keep the law always before him and to meditate on it continually. And here, Paul says that as Christians, we have died to the law. And going back to the principle from verse one, since death has occurred, we've been released. Now we have to recognize that There is not a one-to-one correspondence here between the picture and the point. In the illustration, the husband dies and she is released. The husband dies and the wife is released from obligation to him. In the main point, however, we have died and are now released from the law. And so we don't want to press the analogy too far, but we do get the main idea. And some commentators have criticized Paul here. They've said Paul has an inferior intellect. (laughs) It's amazing. People will say and write and just arrogance. So Paul is just, you know, he's just a bad thinker. He's got a real, real, one one commentator, a well-known commentator said that Paul just has a really inferior imagination. He's unable to construct a robust uh, uh, analogy and illustration and make that plug in just right to the main idea that he is getting across. The main idea is abundantly clear, however. We have died and we are no longer under the law. That's what Paul wants to get across. And specifically, he says that this death has happened in the body of Christ. 
That is, in Jesus' crucifixion, in the crucifixion of Christ, in the, the death that he endured in his body. And then in Romans chapter 6, verse 6, we see our connection to that, our being joined to that. Our old self was what? Crucified with him. Jesus was crucified. When we become Christians, we are crucified with him. We are joined to him in his death. Now, Paul's going to go on and explain this further in verses 5 to 6. And I hope at this point you can see why we didn't venture into those verses as well today. We'll get to those, and he'll explain further what he's talking about here. But as we finish up today, I want you to see the why. That's where we're going to end today. The why. The purposes behind this death to the law. There are three of them. Three purposes to this death to the law for the Christian. So I'm going to go through each of these. First, so that you may belong to another. That's the first purpose Paul gives. In our dying with Christ to the law, we've been united to another in marriage, as it were. Like the wife in the illustration, we are now free to be joined to another. This is the imagery of remarriage. What Paul is saying, the reason he used the illustration that he did in verses 2 and 3 is because he wants to say you've died to the law and now you, you legitimately remarry. It, you legitimately are joined to, united to another. This is the imagery of being the bride of Christ. Christ is called the husband of the church. Not the husband of every individual Christian. That's not really the way that it's understood in the New Testament. It's collective. It's corporate. That Christ is the husband to his bride, the church. And so we read this in Ephesians 5 verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. These are the marching orders for us husbands. And man, how we fail. But this is, what, this is the standard. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. The relationship between a husband and his wife is a picture of the relationship between the bridegroom Christ and his bride, the church. We see it too in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. For I feel a divine jealousy for you. This is Paul writing to the Corinthians, which was a messed up church. And it's interesting that even at the end of the first century, you get, uh, this is after the New Testament, you get um, Clement of Rome, who is a presbyter in Rome, and he writes a letter to the church in court. They were still messed up 30 years later. So they had a lot of problems. But Paul, he labors with this church. He loves this church. Two of the longest letters we have in the New Testament are to this church. And he says, I feel a divine jealousy for you. Why? Why is Paul so concerned about ministering the gospel to them well and their well-being in the gospel since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ? Paul is always thinking as a person who's preparing the bride for the bridegroom, preparing the wife for her husband. So that's the first purpose of our death to the law. We're gonna, like I said, we're going to understand more and more what that means as we go into Romans 7. But we see this basic purpose, so that you may belong to another. The second purpose is so that we may belong to him who has been raised from the dead. So we got to stop there. What is, what is Paul saying? Well, I think he is saying so that we may exist perpetually forever in this union. What has he just painted a picture of? Death in which union is broken. So in verses one to three, the picture is that death ends the union. Death ends the joining together. And what Paul is saying now is that belonging to another, we belong to another in which death can never break that union. This is a union that can now never be interrupted by death. 
the other broken. But this is one bridegroom who will never lose his bride. Never. This is a union that will never be broken. This is a remarriage that is eternal. I love these words from uh, Romans chapter 14, verses 8 to 9. And some of you have told me before that you really like these verses. They're, they're precious to us. I think these are great verses to read if you're dying. I think these would be the kinds of verses that I would want before my face, in my ear, if I were approaching the end of my life. Here they are, Romans 14, 8 to 9. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. We're the Lord's right now. We'll be the Lord's as we pass through death. And we will belong to the Lord after death. We are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again. Which is what Paul says in our text. He died and lived again that we might be Lord, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. There's no end to this. You belong to the Lord this morning, and that's never going to end. That's why you can be said to have eternal life, Christian, right now. Enjoy your life in Christ. You have it, and you will never lose it. Death will not snatch that away from you. You will pass from being an embodied soul who knows the Lord to a disembodied soul who knows the Lord. And one day you will be once again a re-embodied soul who knows the Lord. So live unto God. We are the Lord's. So that's the second purpose. This is never going to end. It's perpetual. And then finally, third purpose that we get from this end of verse 4 in order that we may bear fruit for God. This is so important. Listen to this, Christian. This is the end goal of your salvation. That you bring glory to God through righteous fruit. God did not I used to hear this growing up. God, if God didn't want us to live this life, if there was no purpose left for us, he would have taken us to heaven when we were saved. That would have been it. But God desires that he be glorified in the earth through the fruit of changed lives, the changed lives of his people in order that we might bear fruit for God's glory. That's why God saved you. He didn't just save you just so you could sit there and just be saved. He saved you so that you could glorify him through righteous fruit in the world, through showing his glory through a gloriously changed life. And we'll talk more about the Holy Spirit next week, but this is the fruit that the Spirit brings into one's life. That's why the Spirit is so important. A person who lives according to the flesh can't do anything in the Spirit, can bear no fruit for God because they don't have the Spirit living in them, right? And this is fruit from the Spirit. This is the fruit of the Spirit. It is the fruit of Christ-like character and good works. Romans 8, 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to what? Be saved and go to heaven? It's not what it says. Predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That's God's purpose for you, Christian. To be conformed to the likeness of Christ, the perfect sinless one. Ephesians 2, 10 for we are his workmanship, many of you know this, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. As Christians, we should be an active bunch. We should be a holy bunch. We should be a God-word 
bunch an others-oriented bunch. Think about it this way. Your entire salvation is for the purpose that you bear fruit for God's glory, period. It's all about God. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about God. All things exist for his glory. Therefore, of course, we should not continue in sin. You see how Paul's roping it back? He's going back to the beginning of chapter 6. Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? What? That doesn't even make any sense. That's ridiculous. That doesn't even deserve an answer. That is a stupid question. You know, you grow, you grow up in school and you hear questions like, you know, you hear people say there's no such thing as a stupid question. That's not true. <laughs> right? We know that's not true. There are many of those. And I have asked probably many of those in my own life. And that is a stupid question. And Paul treats it that way. Of course we should not continue in sin, given this. Of course we don't live in any way we want to, back to the relationship of the Christian to the law of God, the revealed will of God. Of course we don't live an antinomian, uh, against law, non-law kind of life. Because we live to bring glory to God who has revealed himself in his holy law. We'll talk more about that uh, as we move forward. But we belong to another and we exist for his glory. Let's go to God in prayer. and Let's uh, ask that he would cause these truths to settle in our hearts this week. Father, thank you for your word that we've just had here before us. We pray that it would settle well in our minds and hearts and our affections and in our lives practically. Lord, we thank you that we have this time together as Christian people, as brothers and sisters in Christ, as the children of the living God, as those who have been adopted as sons, redeemed from our former life, enslaved to sin, death, and the law with its condemnation. Lord, we praise you that we have these fruits in our lives by which to bring you glory, Lord. Your spirit is so gracious to actually bring fruit from these broken vessels, to bring fruit from these previously rotten and even now pitiful trees. Lord, we just praise you that you do such things and you magnify your greatness. The God of the universe, the creator of all, the I am, the the one who is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, the unchanging one, the eternal triune God. You choose to magnify yourself, your infinite, eternal, holy, perfect, glorious self through us, through how we speak to our neighbor through how we treat our children and our spouse, through the way we use our time and all of that, Lord. How we eat and how we drink. All of these things are the very means of you being glorified in this universe. It's breathtaking, Father. We just thank you that you've called us to such a life. This is a wonderful life you've called us to. Would we live it? For your glory, in Jesus' name. And God, we pray now as we come to the Lord's Supper that you would prepare our hearts, that our hearts would be ready to receive, Lord, and to consider our brothers and sisters as we are part of one body. And Lord, to commune with you. We thank you for this covenant meal, this reminder, just as the Passover was, that the blood has been applied and your wrath has passed over us. We praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll be serving this morning.